This, le this lecture uh, for this hour is going to be on spatially structured biological games when neither players nor space are discrete. Now, in a lot of the games that we've seen, uh, various things have been going on where we had individual agents uh, maybe going around in specific uh, locations in a network of patches or, or sites or cells. What we'd like to do is eventually or try and take that idea of we still have some structure, but we want to return a little bit more to our ecological roots and actually have uh, involvement with um, population densities where there's an actual mass of, of, of p potential players and the environment itself is actually going to be spatially continuous, which is always mathematically interesting uh, a little bit. So to kind of start off with, uh, we're talking about spatial structures and population dynamics. And the populations, of course, are characterized by a couple of things. Now, the first one is where they're actually physically found within the environment that's available to them. All right, so the, the habitat range would be a subset of that particular landscape range. Uh, they're also characterized by the densities that they exhibit at each of these uh, locations. Now, over the course of their uh, lifespan or the course of your simulation or your study, the populations are going to interact. They'll interact with the environment. Uh, they'll gather resources. They'll suffer predation from predators that are existing around there. There may be some environmental constraints that are uh, aiding or in, in their survival or uh, introducing an additional mortality risk uh, in their daily lives. Uh, the most important thing from a, if you're doing the ecology side of things, is that they'll eventually want to do some type of conversion of the resources into reproductive growth. You know, that's kind of the end, end game for most of our biological studies. Um, and a, as part of trying to get those resources, this is where you have the potential for conflict and uh, cooperation within and between the groups. Uh, so this could be within your own kin group. You could fight uh, or you could agree, and so we've seen a couple of examples in the last couple of talks about kind of uh, kin selection or, or group networks. Uh, you could be fighting uh, with your group, within your group, or your group can be uh, uh, going against someone else. Now, in, in addition to that, and here's the important thing when we have space and we're actually talking about the ability of the populations to kind of adjust within their habitat, is that we want them to have the ability to move around the environment. All right, so this is going to be kind of the, the main thing that we're going to drive for is figuring out what to do about movement. Now, the nature of your environment can, if we're talking discrete patches, we could have, say, a ring world, uh, the, just a linear set with the endpoints matching or connecting to one another. We could have uh, an array of locations. We could have more fanciful stars um, and whatnot. But, but what we're going to eventually kind of go for is a little bit more just kind of a 2D actual flat plane or a 1D flat uh, territory uh, around which we'll introduce some heterogeneity of the environment due to, say, resource availability. Now, in terms of the movement that are going to be available to uh, your individuals uh, within your population, some of them can be random. Uh, so if we're talking networks again, these are simply your transition probabilities from one site to the other based upon where you are. If we are in a more continuum uh, setting, this is where we run into unbiased diffusion. Uh, for those of us who do PDE modeling, uh, this is kind of the roughly the equivalent of, of the transition probabilities. Uh, transport, there could be something inside um, the network or inside uh, the space that's actually kind of f carrying individuals along. So this is pretty common with uh, aquatic life. They might be carried along by currents. Uh, might be other things, seasonality that's kind of just naturally forcing you around through a cycle or be moved around by convection. And then the more important thing that we're going to be interested in today is search-driven taxis. This is actually being able to make some pseudo-rational decision about which way to go based on environmental cues. So you'll be looking at things like uh, resource availability, your competition level, whether or not there are predators in the area. Uh, if we wanted to convert this over to some type of uh, seasonal uh, mating system, uh, then you would have during some portions of the time, you'd be interested in mate acquisition, other periods of the time. I know a few of us have, have kind of talked about the issue of uh, with some ungulates, you might have um, the males coming in for 
mating period, for breeding period, and then the females run them off so that they're not a risk for the offspring afterwards. Uh, so these are all the things that could be kind of driven, uh, driving our, our movement here. And kind of the, the classic example that kind of started uh, a lot of this in, in the applied math literature is chemotaxis. So you'd have uh, slime mold aggregates ex exert, um, exuding this um, chemical, and uh, the, the slime mold would be attracting up the gradient of these chemicals. You know, so they would also be diffusing naturally in their environment, but because of this attraction, this is where you would get weird pattern formation um, or potential pattern formation uh, with your slime molds. All right, so in order to talk about the mass games and the continuous environment, we're actually going to start momentarily at discrete uh, events, discrete individuals and discrete sites. And I do this because I want to bring up uh, one of the most famous uh, population distribution arguments out there is the ideal free distribution. Now, the ideal free distribution is assuming that you've got scattered around your environment a number of individual sites, and they have varying value, resource values available to them. And you have a series of birds uh, that are kind of flying up in the air, and they're trying to assess which site that they're going to land in to go eat. All right? Well, okay, so the birds are, are moving around. They can independently choose wherever they want to go. All right? So their choice is their own choice they can observe everything that's going on. So they know the value of this site, and they know it's a good site, they know, they know that there's three competitors here. They look over here, they know it's a poor site. So here in this red one, this is a very poor site, and uh, even, it won't even really sustain that one bird that's living inside of it. Or you could have uh, one underused patch. So here, if you kind of look at our diagram, uh, the, blue, the two in the blue, they have equal fitness for the birds involved. The first one's a larger circle, but it can naturally support two birds. Uh, and so they're getting the same per capita resource as the single bird in this right blue. Whereas uh, the bird occupying the red patch, he's not getting enough, even just by himself. And then down here in this last one, uh, this one bird's in this very rich field all by itself. He's getting more. So if the various birds around here are looking at everything that's going on, then naturally they're going to be able to start jumping from one patch to the other until such a point that everyone has kind of an, an equal fitness no matter where you are. So there's no incentive to change anymore. And if we have the conditions that you can move freely, you have perfect knowledge, and everyone is treated equally within a patch, those are the conditions that we call the ideal free domain. And the resulting distribution that the birds set up is the ideal free distribution. All right. Now, from a math standpoint, do a little bit of just math of, of what that idea looked like. We'd have our set of players, or in this case, birds. Uh, each of the sites that were available, that would be in a, a set of resource values. There'd be a likelihood, depending on um, pr the presentation of your ideal free distribution, there'd be a likelihood that one player would be at a particular site, and it's almost like a transition probability. And from there, we can calculate the total expected number of of individuals at the site, compare the per capita value of that site given the current competition levels, and then our strategic equilibrium, which is the ideal free distribution, the value of every site is equal to the average value, and that's simply the total value of the entire environment divided by all the birds. So the ideal distribution, if we just kind of take this equation and combine it with this one, is that the number of total expected number of competitors at a site are simply going to be in portion of the value of that particular site relative to all the value of the resources available to you. All right. Now, on if we move from that discrete to discrete case, and we say, okay, what if the environment is continuous, but the individuals are still discrete agents? Well, we could have a situation, uh, such as we're observing here, that the populations, they want to move around, and they're going to interact not just with their exact location, but they're going to interact in the environment through kind of the wider area. So this would be, for instance, uh, you, you have a home range, and there's a home site for your animal. It, uh, it patrols a territory around it, or that would be its hunting ground. And the size of the hunting ground, the size of that range, uh, would vary, potentially vary from population to population or individual to individual. And so you would interact uh, with the environment over this range, and then you would also interact with others in the, in 
other uh, animals or other populations if you run into a situation where your ranges overlapped with one another. That's where the conflict would come in. And so we have an, a kind of an example here. Uh, we've got two individuals, um, one in red here, one in blue. And presently in, th in this top configuration in the environment, they don't interact with each other. They're equally happy. They're kind of getting along just fine, getting the maximum resources that they can obtain out of this environment. On the other hand, if we suddenly move the, the right uh, player over a little bit, now we have this zone of overlap between the two. All right, and because of that, they're suboptimal, and one or both of the players will want to move in order to improve their fitness. And so if we looked at, okay, what are all the configurations that would actually work for us that, so that everyone is getting a maximum amount of resources? Well, okay, we have this kind of rough schematic that we have here. If this is the position of player one, and we consider a position of player two here on the vertical axis, uh, there's a zone around the margin that neither one necessarily wants to actually be at, because that means that your range technically is extending outside of the, the valid uh, hunting ground or, or grazing area. But if there's uh, sufficient distance between the players, uh, then they're perfectly fine and content to stay where they are. And, and if they're in the white area here, well, that's when they have the overlap, and they'll kind of want to push each other away. So both of them will, will in, in this particular basic mock-up, both of them will want to run away. So this is how we could think about uh, a continuous environment with the discrete individuals. Now let's flip that. All right, what if we have mass players and discrete environments? Now this is the one that's probably most familiar for the ecologist. This is when you're doing patch uh, modeling or metapopulations and compartment models. You see these types of organizations. They're, we go back and we have some uh, system of connection. There could be connection within large units, uh, within the units themselves. There may or may not be complete connectivity. Uh, and so there would be different routes for organisms to move around and obtain resources in each of these islands. And so uh, a common example of an experiment doing something very similar to this, uh, these white blocks would actually represent a styrofoam floating uh, on, on an on a, uh, artificial uh, water tank, on a water tank, and each one would be holding a set of potted plants. And there would be some mites or whatever being able to cross, and they could cross along these bridges. Uh, from plant to plant or from uh, uh, tray to tray. And this whole system was kind of floating. So if, you f if the mite fell off into the water, they'd drown. And so you could look at the dynamics that might happen here. All right. Uh, as part of what would go on in a system like this, of course, the densities are going to evolve according to the movements and the local dynamics going on. So we have both of those affecting uh, the population. And uh, as a result of all this going forward with the interactions uh, between the organisms in the environment and the organisms with one another, the ranges uh, could expand or contract for the individuals across this neighbor, uh, across this uh, system. Now, here's where we start to say, okay, let's combine that. Let's take that continuous environment, let's take these mass uh, populations, and let's say, what happens if we throw them together? And the particular treatment that I'm going to talk about for the remainder of the day is called the ideal ideally motivated populations. And this is basically a continuum analog of the ideal free distribution. All right, so in, according to the classical ideal free distribution, you know, we had this uh, series of sites that each had their own respective uh, resource value. Well, in this case, uh, we're going to have a connected continuum domain. The resource may vary at these sites, so there can still be resource heterogeneity and, and things to make the environment look different for at different locations. Uh, the birds can independently choose which site that they want to use in the classic sense uh, and here. Uh, and there's no cost for moving. All right. We're going to have kind of a similar thing here. There's going to be this observability. Uh, the individuals can see the local resource availability and competition. They have that power. But uh, whereas the classic could only look, or, or the classic case, the birds would, could fly up and essentially have omniscience about the entire system. In this particular case, individuals can only look at their immediate local area. So right here, they're going to only assess the local variation in the resources and competitions. This is essentially then that they're looking at the gradient of, of what's available to them uh, with all of these things. 
again, there's still no actual barrier to movement per se, uh, although competitors might be in your way and you may decide not to pursue, or the resource, you might encounter a resource valley or desert, and you might decide, I don't want to cross the resource desert. But there's nothing physically barring potential movement uh, from one location to the other. Uh, so this was, of course, uh, in the classical sense, this was where birds existed in an ideal free domain. And here we're just going to kind of call this the ideal free movement because we have all those same basic premises. And we just made one slight adjustment to the uh, omniscience of the bird and kind of restricted their view to just a local window uh, that they currently inhabit. Uh, the most important thing here that as we convert it to a PDE is we're going to take the population flux to be proportional to that uh, gradient uh, in the fitness or the resource that they can recover from the environment. Yes? Uh, the, yeah, that's, ac that's actually in a mathematical sense. So it's connected simply. Hmm? No holes in the domain. Yeah, and so, so yeah, for those, uh, yeah, we're talking basically about a shape. There's no holes in the domain, although even that, I think, actually is not necessarily in and of itself actually required. Just to kind of start off the thing, usually uh, when you do some of these analysis, you start off with the simplest case. That's the best case scenario. No holes, easily connected domain. All right. So just a, a little bit of uh, kind of technical information about what's going on from the math. Uh, as a basic setup, you can start to relax some of these things as you want to add additional features. But as a basis, uh, you're going to have a fitness function, S. Uh, it's going to be a function of the available local resources. And the in this case, this is a one species model. Uh, it'll be uh, density dependent. So. What we're going to look for in this fitness response is that as, your com as the density goes up among competitors, the individual fitness goes down. You know, the more crowded you are, just the less you're getting of the resources. Whereas on, if, as resources in increase, uh, fitness for the individual will also increase. All right, so those are the things that we'll have there. Uh, there's a minimal fitness. So in terms of our scoring, whatever you choose to do, S can't go lower than zero. And if there's no resources, we'll call that zero. Uh, smoothness, that's just to make the math a little bit nicer. If you're actually doing simulations and you, you go for a patch uh, treatment of what's going on here or, or a patch approximation smoothness, we can kind of fudge around that a little bit. And then resources are positive. And here's the important thing for to make this model interesting. At the range limit, we want the resources to completely drop out. We want this to be a relatively self-contained area. So no one's going to migrate in, no one's going to migrate out because the resources are not there. Not so much of because of a physical uh, boundary that's preventing flux across the environment or because that there's some type of absorbing state that's uh, killing individuals that, that run off the edge of the map. All right. Now, if we take all that, then we get this dynamic equation that we have here. This is saying that the rate of change over time of our population density at a given location is going to be equal to this flux, uh, which is generated by traveling up uh, the fitness gradient, all right, and then plus some uh, local dynamics where we actually take that fitness and convert it into reproductive growth. So just to kind of talk about the individual points here, K is your sensitivity to the information. So if you're more sensitive, you will move faster up the environment, environmental gradient if it's provided to you. Uh, R is the, your ability to convert that fitness, which is the kind of the raw resource, and that's the ability to convert those resources into actual reproductive growth. And then mu is going to be our per capita mortality. And uh, I, now that I see this up here on the board, this should actually be um, RUS minus mu over r, kind of pulling, pulling all this in. So you, if you wish to make a note here on the dynamic equation, that mu is actually mu over r. Now you'll have an initial condition and a boundary condition. That's kind of your basic standard for the PDEs. And but what we're going to be most interested in is kind of looking at how can we describe what's going on here. And the one thing that I want to point out, and this will come back later at, towards the end of the talk, is that S is observable, all right? That's something, that's the thing that we've, we've said that the individual is moving based on. 
uh, sensitivity itself is not directly per se, um, uh, it's not directly per se uh, part of that incorporation. Metabolic efficiency and mortality are definitely not, in the, not involved in S. And so that means that potentially in, in the way that we've, the way that I've kind of written it up this way is that the individuals um, can be blind to risk or they can be blind to food quality. They may see something that looks very abundant, but it might be very poor nutritious, poor, um, might have a, a very poor nutrition level. So those are things that the individual is, is blind to. All right, moving forward. Based on that, if we just talk about what happens when we are just moving around the environment, and this is kind of the same idea ex expanded out, one of the kind of the math results here was that if we were just looking about the moving around the environment part, we, we have this very nice thing where there are current peaks in your fitness and current valleys in your fitness, and if they happen to uh, be populated, that the, the peaks do not decrease. Uh, excuse me, the peaks do not increase and the valleys do not decrease. Instead, they'll generally try and contract in and they'll push more and more and more until that they're essentially, uh, they flatten out all the variation in the, in the populated areas, fitness, all right? And this is kind of where we get to the ideal free distribution concept. Everything is uniformly fit. There's no difference in, in moving, all right? So we see that here. Uh, this is a heterogeneous landscape, so this kind of uh, bell curve is representing our resources here in the black dashed line. Uh, and we see kind of the same thing here. So these are kind of almost actually swapped a little bit in position. So let's say we initially started off with this black line representing uh, the population distribution. So we have some wavy initial population that's going on here. As they look at the environment and each individual is, is kind of seeing their own little segment of this gray dashed line here. And that's showing areas where you are likely to see uh, a, a divergence or a convergence of your population through the flux. So here at this location where we have this uh, peak right here in the gray, you'll notice it corresponds a little bit to a population trough. All right. What's going to happen is that the populations to the right of the, to the left of the trough are going to move rightward into it, and those to the left of, right of the trough will move leftward into it. So they'll kind of mash in. Whereas those at the peaks will tend to want to go to off the peak and, and away from those areas because they correspond to a valley in the fitness. Now, if you allow this to go over time, what will happen is, of course, that fitness landscape, the way, and this is the collective view of the population based off of those individual measurements, is that the fitness is flattened wherever and uniform wherever the density is uh, non-zero. Now, it can drop below that in unpopulated areas, but those are simply regions that are insufficient to, to, be, to be bothered with currently. Now, for the type of functional response that we'll use primarily for m uh, much of the discussion here is this form right here. Uh, S is going to be equal to the uh, resource value at the location divided by some amount of time that you have to spend in competition plus some basic amount of just dealing with the environment and retrieval of resources. And so basically what's happening here with, our, with the competition is you're essentially interference and you're, you're causing a delay in the ability of, org of each other to uh, obtain the resources from the environment. Now, the one thing I would like to point out is that if I actually multiplied this by u, all right, that's the fitness times u right here. This is actually just one of your basic saturation curves. So what's the total grazing effect? And all we're doing is simply saying, okay, you, we have this effect on, on the available resources. You know, it's this nice S sat or this nice saturation curve. If we divide out by the population so that we get the per capita treatment, this is actually the function that would kick out. So you could do this with anything that was, say, um, Rx over x plus 1 or Rx squared over x squared plus 1, any of your type of basic chemical reaction saturation curves. You can take those and then just divide off a power, and you suddenly have a new fitness to represent the, the saturation that would go along uh, in that particular case. Now, the fitness landscape, that's the perception that's going on. Um, that's our uh, S. All right, and then because of uh, what's going on, the fitness curve eventually flattens. Now, we could actually characterize uh, a population if it actually has obtained this ideal 
distribution, we can uh, just kind of declare a contour value to represent that fixed fitness value in the populated area. And then we kind of reverse engineer what would be the distribution given that curve. And so in this partic for this particular model, uh, that would be R divided by C minus H and uh, zero wherever that happened to be uh, non-positive. Uh, these are all uh, in a one-to-one -one correspondence, so it's very nice uh, if you look at diff different distributions over time. And as the system goes along, each of these curves impose a natural range limit on the population. They don't cover everywhere that there's food. They just cover enough for their current po overall population size. And also that the, uh, this contour value is eventually going to approach kind of the effective mortality, which is uh, mu over r. And that will be uh, what kind of uh, puts everything in equilibrium. So one of the treatments that you can do with a system like this uh, in some, some uh, ecology, you sometimes will see a fast time and slow time dynamic. So one of the things that when I was originally first kind of looking at this, I was saying, okay, what happens if movement is faster than the actual accumulation of resources in the dying processes? All right, so if we, go, if we do that, then we have that ideal free distribution kind of obtained by the environment. If we flipped it, you'd kind of be, you'd suffer the consequences and go to your local equilibrium, and then if you're still surviving, then you can contribute and populate a surrounding area. Um, or we could have these uh, in real somewhat uh, equivalent time scales. But if we go with this fast, slow uh, time scale system, we do know that uh, the contour value is going to be driven to this mortality divided by uh, metabolic efficiency. And uh, C itself is actually going to be uh, driven by this equation right here. Uh, we, so we see the derivative is equal to C um, times RC minus mu times uh, CH over, this is the average value of R. We have the uh, angled brackets, that's the average value over the inhabited region, minus one. And what's happening here, C corresponds to an infinitely massive population. No one is fit. Everyone's just going to die out because you've just oversaturated uh, the location. Whereas RC minus mu, well, that is course, that's going to correspond when that's zeroed out. That's going to be here at this equilibrium that I was talking about. Over here, this is this last little factor that we've got going on here. So long as the resources that you're inhabiting are doing pretty well, that's going to move you up. But if RC, if, if uh, this critical uh, equilibrium contour value is less than what's available at the maximum, this is always going to be positive and your local attractor or your attractor in this system is going to be here uh, it's, it's actually going to be here where this is uh, zeroed out. And so that means that there's everyone, everyone, the population has died out, essentially, in that case. Uh, we can also take from here uh, an idea about the speed of expansion of the wave based off of this change in the contour. And in, in a more generalized setting, if we wanted to go off, not use the function that I described here, uh, we could get an analogous situation of describing uh, the change of the contour level or uh, producing a range expansion rate uh, based off of that, assuming everything was in an ideal distribution as it moved out. Now this is a little bit of the mathematics that was kind of going on behind how we got th these two equations over here on the side. Very quickly, one is simply looking at uh, kind of the, the sum total of what was going on with the individual population dynamics. The other was looking at what happens uh, with the contour, knowing that there's a re direct relationship between the total population size and the contour value. And if you look at the changes uh, in both of those, equate them together and, and do a little multivariate calculus to kind of throw out a couple of terms that zero out, we wind up at our equation down here. So that's kind of the origin of where it came from. Now, once we've got this basic idea, though, that we've got these populations that are moving around in the environment and they're trying to match or they'll eventually uh, create this uniform fitness across the landscape. One of the interesting ideas is what happens if, you, if your environment was not a single peaked environment, but actually there was multiple peaks, all right? So if you have one high area of resource, you've got another high area of resource, and in between, you're going to have uh, 
a number, or you're going to have some type of depressed area, a resource valley or a resource desert. And if we look at something like that, then if we start off with a population, say, on, in one high resource area, they'll do their distribution and they'll, and they'll be kind of restricted under that particular um, hilltop or, or resource peak area until it reaches, until the uh, range of the, of the population reaches that valley. Then once it hits the valley, what it does is every time it wants to expand, well, that expansion is going to kind of kick off some people and they're going to fall off the edge and run away over to the other uh, resource peak. So suddenly you get this, po uh, this continental island uh, contribution where you have the, the original population uh, uh, going on and they, if you say start here, well, okay, population one under the first resource curve, kind of looking something in that configuration, all right, it's going to maximize until it hits the valley, then all of its excess population growth is going to be diverted to fill up the second population area, and then finally, once they're contiguous, they'll uh, grow together. So what happens is that we would have this peak, and then uh, the other one would fill up. This actually shows it a little bit better. We start off with the initial population here in this window. As time evolves, moving uh, backwards to the right, we see that the population, the initial population is uh, preserved, and then eventually we hit this uh, location where we're, we're reaching into the valley, and all of our contributors are now flowing over here. So there's a one-way directional travel uh, of the population from the original site into the new site. And then eventually, towards the back end, uh, that valley fills up a little bit with, with popu populated individuals. And they're all, at that point, now one large population rather than two individual sites. Uh, let's see, we could also think about what happens when um, conditions require that there be uh, some level of mortality to uh, come into play. So if we establish that we had these two interconnected sites, uh, there's some event that just n reduces the resource availability just overall. All right, so maybe you experience a drought in the wider region. All right, all of a sudden you're going to separate out these populations because nobody wants to be in that valley. They run out and they'll, separ uh, and they'll uh, segregate from one another. Uh, let's see, we could also think about this in terms of uh, source sink dynamics, where what would happen in this instance if uh, this population could not itself actually sustain uh, at a given site, uh, or, um, could not uh, sustain due to the mortality that was uh, specific to this location, but because you had all this excess, you could still kind of continue to pour people into into this new area, into the sink area, based off of this source. You ha and you had a very nice way of kind of pushing people into the area. All right. So there's a couple of other things that you could theoretically do uh, with this model. You could kind of change around the resources. In this initial model, it was just kind of uh, a standing resource. It wasn't actually being affected. But if you wanted to, you could put in some type of level of resource degradation, so the more activity that was going on you can kind of it, begin to experiment with what's going on within the model mathematically. Uh, we could also change, like I said, we can change this, fit, uh, this fitness function. Uh, we could make it mass action, so you just run into your prey, and whatever frequency that is, that's what you get, and it's not really density dependent uh, relative to your particular population. Uh, there could be some saturation where, even though it's a very abundant area of the of uh, resources, uh, it may be that, you know, you c at the end of the day, you can only eat one banana, all right? You might have 10 bananas, but you can only eat one uh, just because that's all you can really eat. So uh, you can incorporate that and then talk about this one in just a little bit. You can also incorporate an Ali effect, all right? So you could improve mom for, for a short period by getting more of your kind working together and then eventually um, that kind of uh, saturates out and, you, and there's a limit to how much effect that you can get from uh, cooperators. So speaking of the cooperators, this is where we start looking at competition and what happens in a model like this. So um, for the math people around here, um, we've got a couple of terms from ecology. We've got our sympatry, which is simply saying that the territories of two distinct populations are going to be overlapping. So that's what we have here. Allopatry, they're going to be separated from one another. Uh, it's kind of what we saw in that model of discrete agents in a continuous environment. 
you know, if they were separate from one another, that's allopatric. If they're kind of butting heads, trying to interfere with one another, that's a uh, little bit of sympatry going on. Uh, there's a couple of different ways they can interact with one another. Uh, so direct competition, they could actually kind of be going to war, killing each other, uh, or, or injuring at, at some level. Uh, indirectly, they could be reducing the habitat quality, either through resource degra degradation and the actual use of the resources, or something else that's uh, lessening the quality of the environment uh, relative to your uh, heterospecifics. And then uh, what we're kind of more focused here on is this idea of the interference. So you're just kind of causing a delay in the ability uh, to, to extract the resources from the environment. Now for our interspecific competition, we're basically going to have two populations and they're each going to have their own individual fitness. So here we have SI, I being one or two. Again, it's going to be dependent on the resource and then it's going to be dependent on the densities of two different populations. And it's roughly the same type of formula that we were using previously, provides a, a good contrast. Uh, what's going to be very specific here though is we're going to weight the strength of interference potentially differently. So if I encounter a, a conspecific, I'll interact one way. If I, in, if I encounter a heterospecific, I'll interact another way. And that itself may be asymmetric. So I may be able to bully you and ignore you, or we may be very, very hostile to one another, or we may actually be sharing different parts of a resource, so we kind of ignore one another altogether because we're not actually interfering. We still have our same basic dispersal competition model, and here is the more corrected version. Uh, and we're going to look at various contrasts, uh, not so much the sensitivity uh, on this slide, but uh, we're going to look at what happens when you're ability to kind of gather up resources differs, or what happens when you can convert the resources into reproductive growth? What if that differs? Uh, what if your mortality r risks are different? Uh, your interference things. And then lastly, there's actually, what if the resource curve itself is actually clinally dependent? So there might have a, a gradient of acidity. And so th w over in this area, it's a very acidic environment. Over in this area, it's very alkaline based. And one population will do well with an acidic food, the other one more alkaline-based food. All right, so there'll be some overlap, but because of that, the abundance might be a little more uniform, but they'll be looking at different um, distributions of the resource uh, and, and make different decisions based upon that. Yes? So reading the dispersal Yeah. That's our dispersal, and that's exactly the same thing as what we had previously. Uh, the only difference is this is strictly one-dimensional, uh, whereas in the, in the basic concept model, uh, it actually did it uh, as a full multi-dimensional uh, flux factor. Yeah. And, and then... Mortality is actually dependent on the density of... No, it's a per capita mortality rate. So, so the more that there are, the more will die, but everyone's dying at the same individual rate. Uh, the only thing that was slightly, as I said, was a typo uh, that I just saw as I was putting this up was right here. This actually, because I was kind of combining terms, that actually should have been a mu over r, not a mu by itself. So, didn't we just, yeah, so that ends up being mu squared. No, no, mu over r. Yeah. r times u is the density, s is the, the resource recovery, and minus mu, that's the mortality. So, so it's not mu square, it's u times mu. Yeah. Yeah. So that's just use and use, yes. Yes, that's mu over r. So, that, so that's the correction that everyone needs to make in their notes. That one should be mu over r. Yeah. Uh, let's see. We're at down to here's one. This is, th this is, ah, is that really u, u? Mu, that should be mu i u i. Let me make, let me, I, and this will be corrected before we get the finalized version up to, uh, here at NIMBIAS. So, so that, that'll, be, that'll be corrected by tonight, Paul. But, uh, this, yes, this should be mu i u sub i. That's just, a, yeah, what's down here in the, in the subscript is our, is our index. That's a, yeah, thank you for correcting on that. All right. So we've got a variety of things that we want to kind of play with in the model. Uh, first one is, can these things actually coexist in the same location based off of their current uh, density levels? Well, there, 
we have this sympatry uh, s uh, condition right here, and it's based off the relative uh, interference that they provide to one another. Uh, so this ratio may exist between these values. I if so, then everything's wonderful. They can coexist. They'll be happy. If, on the other hand, one of these conditions is uh, observed and the other one is not, then there will be a dominance invasion in that local area. So one population will come in and kind of push the other person out. On the other hand, if neither of these work, uh, which basically means that the um, inequality chain's kind of been flipped in order, what happens is in that situation is that the, the heterospecific interference is actually so much greater than the conspecific interference that you're fighting with, with the other group so much. You're going to create this natural mosaic that everyone's just kind of jostling each other and no one can, can really set up an actual tr uh, basic uh, con uh, continuum range. All right. So what that kind of looks like, uh, just as a point of emphasis here, this is a population, um, uh, kind of ignore what we have here on the left and focus a little more here on the right. Here we have a population that was uh, initially resident, all right? And we allowed a different population that had a slightly different fitness uh, level or, or fitness function to come in, all right? And it was uh, initially small amount. And then over time, or, or excuse me, uh, the initial, the other one was put in here in, gr in gray. And what happened is that over time, the one over here on the right pretty much became dominant, and the other one on the left kind of was into a reduced state. And whether or not that that would be permanent or if it would completely die out uh, would be predicated a little bit on whether or not there was any zone of, of sympatry available or if there was any refuges available uh, to the population. If we jacked up the, inter the interference between populations, this is when we get if you look here, th these are kind of actually completely alternating uh, locations uh, between populations. They're constantly fighting and jostling. Everything's kind of intermixed together, but no one's a actually sharing anything. They're just kind of constantly swirling about. But even within there, there can still be some measure of, of areas that are preserved uh, between the populations, uh, or where one, where, where one who's maybe slightly weaker uh, is able, because it had enough initial population size, it could uh, push out the other person and prevent novel uh, invasions of the, in of the area. Now, if we compare the individual factors that might be uh, contrasted a little bit, if sensitivity is, the, that's the K parameter, if that happened to be the thing that was varying between the populations, everything was pretty much arbitrary uh, for the most part. Uh, they could occur high resource area, low resource area, uh, sim they could occur uh, allopatrically or in sympatry. None of that uh, particularly mattered with sensitivity. Whereas, if we affected uh, reproductive, if we affect, if we affected mortality or the metabolic efficiency, so that's the mu and r parameters. Uh, the transient phase it doesn't really care. You're not going to separate things out a whole lot. But at the steady state level, when this thing goes off to equilibrium. Uh, the population that has the lower effective mortality will dominate the entire area and exclude the other one and drive it to extinction. Uh, interference, if you are stronger, so that your alphas are better than the, than the other party's al uh, A's, uh, then you can overlap in certain areas. So uh, kind of as an example here uh, that we had in this box, this was with the effective mortality being differed. All right, they just kind of overlap wherever they happen to be. All right, if there's interference over here on the far end, they will overlap. Uh, it's a little bit smaller here in this particular configuration, but you can see that there's overlap here and overlap here between the curves. And then if you are differ by the resource collection parameter, which was that H term, which was kind of your basic rate of just working the environment. That uh, is going to lead to parapatry. You know, the, the two populations are going to be right up against each other, but they're not going to want to overlap. All right. And over time, of course, all three of these here in the middle, they're going to lead to exclusion. Uh, whoever is kind of dominant on that particular feature, they'll exclude out the other. Uh, clinal variation, uh, it's typically characterized by, ideally, by parapatry in both transient periods of the time and the longer steady state distributions. What's interesting though is that how does the world look 
to people? Uh, how, do, how does the world look to individuals based on their fitness? So if I have some resident population that's already kind of established itself, and I'm some rare mutant, I'm going to look at this environment based off not just the resources, but also the, the competition that I'm going to face. So the assumption is here that uh, we, we've, got a, a domin uh, we've got a resident population that's already at equilibrium. And this right here, these, each of these four curves, represents the perspective of a new invader if they are weaker than the resident population, if they are physically stronger. So those are the, alpha, those are the A terms, whether or not you can impose or ignore interference competition. Or if they are more skilled at working the environment, so you have a smaller H parameter, or if you're a little bit clumsier with the environment and you have a larger H environment. What happens as a, as a basic rule is that if you are weaker, you tend to be marginalized. All right, so the weakers will have to go out to the ends. If you are clumsy and, and you're a new person and you're clumsy, you're going to try and go into the center. And so that's where you get uh, kind of the, the gray line here. You're going to try and go in because that's the better place that you could be. Uh, or excuse me, that's the, this one here, the black dashed line. All right. So you're going to try and centralize. You're still going to be excluded over the long term. But that's where, over the short term, you're going to see these uh, new populations that are going to just kind of try and gravitate towards the center. On the other hand, if I introduce somebody who is physically stronger, they're going to rush to the middle and, and displace, uh, they're going to go for those high value areas and displace uh, the existing resident. And if I am more skilled at using the environment, I'll go ahead and actually hang around uh, these low resource areas because they're, they're marginal, but they're untapped. There's no competition, and, I make, and I'll make use of those, uh, low re those, excuse me, those low resource areas uh, to kind of improve my fitness, and then eventually what I'll do is I'll kind of come in and collapse and, and surround uh, the resident and then uh, end him at the, at the resource maximum. So this is how th the world looks according to those various fitness functions uh, if we start varying different things. Now, we could also go to what happens with a performance trade-off, all right? So what if one of you is uh, metabolically very fit, but you're not a fighter? Uh, we can come up with, as the resources are running from low to high in each of these blocks, there's a variety of different outcomes uh, that can happen. So if uh, we have that the uh, first population is metabolically fit, and the second population is very skilled, there's two outcomes that could happen. Uh, the metabolically fit could be out in the lower margins and the uh, handlers could be up in the, in the high areas. Let me make sure I've got that in the right location. Uh, might have that, yeah, or the, excuse me, I had that backwards. The handlers are out in the marginal area. Uh, the metabolically efficient are in the, the resource rich areas or the, res uh, the metabolically efficient can completely exclude uh, the skilled individuals. And then for each of these various trade-offs, there's, there's a potential set of configurations that the environment could actually display as a result of that. All right. Well, we've also talked a lot about this uh, these last couple of days about cooperation. So what would happen if we changed the fitness functions themselves, not just parameters, but the actual fitness functions? So here's kind of our base model. All right. And then over here, this is uh, your basically your type 2 uh, functional response saturation. Uh, this is where your cooperators are. They have an Ali effect, all right? So initially, you are better off by getting more of your kind around. You improve your individual fitness, but there's ultimately that's going to limit, and, and fitness will decline again. Uh, they're going to have individual uh, inhabitable ranges based off of these performances. Uh, equilibrium densities will also vary based off of the, the fitnesses that are involved. They're also uh, very important, um, the self-reliance or this kind of base model that we've talked about most of the time today, these are pioneer species. They're naturally going to go out in the model. It, it, they, will, they will maximize uh, their range that, that they can achieve within the environment. Uh, it's very nice uh, for all intents and purposes. It's globally stable, uh, convergent. Cooperators, on the other hand, 
uh, they're natural aggregators. So we kind of get back to the same problem of what happens with chemotaxis. There's this natural sense of, oh, there's this collection. Let's go back to the collection. Now, it's not as bad as chemotaxis in the sense that there's a natural cutoff. You can't have infinite spikes, which you sometimes can get with a chemotactic model. Uh, but they're, whoops, they are natural aggregators. And because of this, there is the potential for a little bit more uh, spatial instability. The, they're going to, they don't like to go into new areas. They don't want to, and if things are particularly odd in, in your initial distribution, you can get some um, separation of the population in, uh, as it kind of clusters and clumps up. Now, they look at the, at the environment. So here we have our resource curve in both of these settings. All right, both of these happen to be at fitness. So uh, gray is representing the density. All right. And uh, the black dashed line is representing the fitness view of the world. Both of these are, are perfectly fit uh, or are equally fit. And they see the universe where they're, they're inhabiting as flat. Uh, the co cooperators, they technically, they do have multiple solutions. Uh, there is one that's the upper one. It's the most common one. There's actually a lower one. And if you were trying to do uh, just local dynamics, looking at the, throw out the movement and just look at local dynamics, this one up here at the top is, is your attractor. This is a repeller. And so if you start with too few individuals, there's just not enough of you to sustain. You have to kind of, that's a threshold, but if you get enough of them available, they can grow to that higher state. All right. Well, if we put them in competition, uh, our idea again is that uh, we're simply going to delay uh, your ability to recover resources. We'll, we'll kind of say, okay, the cooperators, they're influencing uh, times um, quadratically, whereas the, the baseline is, is influencing things linearly. All right. As a result of this, there, who is going to kind of push out the other one is going to be dependent on what the initial starting densities are. All right. If things are small, then there's just not enough uh, for the cooperator to work with, and so the, the baseline population will take off. If the populations are relatively high, uh, then the basins of attraction will actually tend to favor um, the cooperator populations, and they'll be able to exclude. Um, there's a couple of different things that could happen, just as we saw uh, with, the, with the base model in competition. If we start varying some of the parameters, like the competition or interference levels, uh, your basic model is that they're going to um, mutually exclude one another, so either all selfish or all cooperative. Uh, you could also have selfish dominance. Um, this is basically a special case. This, this one down here at the bottom left is a special case of the top. And then you could also, under weak interspecific pressure, you could have sympatry. Uh, and it's, it's not globally attractive. It's going to depend on your initial conditions. Uh, but you could have an all-selfish population, or you could have uh, some kind of polymorphic state where you have both selfish and cooperators coexisting in the same location. Now here's kind of the punchline for this though, that as the, popu as the resources increase, no matter where, what style that you're looking at currently, it will eventually always go to mutual exclusion. High resources as they continue to increase will force a conflict between uh, the selfish individual and, and a cooperator, cooperator population. Uh, we could also include parasites, so we do slight variations of what's going on here. Uh, since we're approaching in on time, I won't spend too much on this, but the idea is that you have your parasites, they come in and they're going to uh, meet with you at a certain mass action frequency. All right, so uh, th that's kind of our standard way of doing pretty much all basic models of interaction that this at least start off with. And then as a result of that, what happens is that the host which would have been one of the two previous uh, populations that we were looking at, uh, they're going to have their fitness decrease according to this factor. Now, theta is essentially the amount of resources stealing from, from the host and for the kleptoparasite. And the parasite, from his per capita perspective, is going to have this expression down here. Now, the thing to understand is that this is eff effectively uh, showing a transfer of one group to another group and then looking at what is that from a, from a per capita perspective of each of those groups. So that's why this one has a U3 uh, in its term, but this one has the UI for the host. 
if we if we multiplied them by the corresponding positions, the U1 right here, all right, then we actually get the total amount of uh, of all fitnesses being transferred, all resources being transferred from here to here. They'd match up. All right. So what do we see when we uh, look at these? Uh, Self-reliance are pretty are able to maintain low resource refuges against parasites, uh, but they do get depressed in the high resource areas, so we get this mismatch at the, at the trophic levels. Uh, high resources are going to be more uh, parasite dominant. Uh, the cooperators, because they have that ALE effect and, and they don't do well at low numbers, you can potentially, with a parasite, uh, initiate an instability. So it spirals out of control until you cross a threshold after which the population completely ends. All right, so we can kind of see that behavior going on here. Now, what it looks like in space, all right, we can see this is as an example here. We've got our uh, parasitized uh, selfish population. So that's here in gray. Uh, the darker gray that you're seeing here, that is the uh, parasite. So the parasite's occupying the high resource areas, whereas the uh, host selfish individuals have to uh, make do with the marginal areas, and it's not just from the dynamics, they're also actually forcing themselves out. Uh, and whereas the cooperators, you know, if, it, if the resources are too high, that'll actually collapse, collapse the system. So no, one, no one's there, and no one's going to try and repopulate the area. All right, last thing that I want to mention, just in go, uh, quickly, harvesting. How could we take this same model and look at it in harvesting? Uh, the big idea, of course, is we want to have a safe level of harvesting. If we, we don't want to take too much, and we also want to kind of preserve the local stock. Uh, the question, though, is normally when we talk about harvesting, they talk about total take rate, or they talk about specific sites and what they're doing. What I'm interested in is what if I have this harvest area, how does that affect the, um, the population over here and over here and over here? There are places not immediately directly within the harvest zone, but they're still going to be affected. And so we actually have to take into account three things. Uh, we have to take into account the mortality or the take rate, but we also need to f worry about its breadth and its, f and its location in the environment. So we're going to kind of start with the same thing that we had with our first species. All right, we'll just use that same base model to work on. And the main difference is that here at the mortality, uh, within this particular harvest range, we're going to add a little bit of extra mortality. That's the boats coming in to kind of take things. All right. As a result of that, what happens is that when we're looking at, at our contour fitness, if we didn't have harvesting, the system would drive to um, an equality level uh, defined by mu over r. Whereas if we do have harvesting in, in restricted areas as opposed to the entire area, we get this larger equation that has to be solved. So this is actually uh, an integral. This is an integral. This is over the entire populated area, whereas this one is over the region that's being harvested. And so you have to look for the balance that's occurring there. Uh, kind of skipping through the math just a little bit, but um, as a result of that additional extra harvesting, there are effects to the changes in the equations that we saw with the base model. All right, in different locations, uh, it'll affect the contour equation, it'll affect the change of the total population, and but ultimately, uh, our equilibrium contour value we can kind of come up with, it's, it's set by the old mortality to, to uh, metabolic efficiency rate plus this additional term based, this based on the physical size of the environment uh, and the quality of the environments in, involved relative to the harvesting area, harvest zone, and the non-harvest zone. All right, so what does this look like? This is a uh, bifurcation diagram. And we can see that if we change things up just a little bit, kind of go through here, uh, that as harvest increases, all right, that's going to drive the contour value. So that basically means more and more of you being taken. And depending on the physical location of where you've set your site, you can introduce this bifurcation. So this is the issue of you go too far, you suddenly you collapse the population. All right, and we can see that. And the important thing here is that you're collapsing the population, not just of where you were at, but over the entire wider region. So in this zone, if I were to say um, fishing over there, and I had additional fish over here, all, all through this zone, my fish over here are fine. All right? They might slowly be decreasing. But as soon as I hit this point, even though I was doing all my activity over there, all the fish over here collapse. The entire system spatially 
I is going to break down. So that's what's going on here. And we could actually kind of see what happens as I change the harvest intensity. Or excuse me, this is the harvest intensity. This is where I physically position the harvest. And over here, this is me varying the breadth of the harvest. So each of the different ways in which I can control things are going to shape that bifurcation curve and uh, create this, uh, this uh, situation at different locations. All right, this can also, as a result from our dynamics, if we do rapid movement, uh, that will have one effect. If we do slow movement, that will have a different effect. So this is a very high harvest kill area. If they're kind of at comparable time zones, uh, you'll tend to, your simulation will tend to wind up with something like this. All right. And then uh, this, as a result, is uh, going to create a bit of a proximity fitness. So the closer that you are to the, to the harvest site, um, you're going to be a little bit less fit relative to, com uh, to your competitors. And it'll be actually, the sink will actually induce a natural progression wave of one successive population into the other. Because th they'll move from these marginal sites into uh, the harvest zone and just kind of constantly replace one another as a result. All right. So... What have we talked about here uh, today? Basically, ideal ideally motivated populations that are kind of a continuum analog of the ideal free distribution. We get to be able to use our, both our dynamical, our ODEs and our PDEs in describing them. Uh, the populations will tend to adopt spatial arrangements based on their performance characteristics relative to their peers. So uh, strong will be in the center, skilled people at the marginal areas, uh, some Populations will be forced into refuges. Others will not have those refuges available to them, and systems could collapse. And we could see all this playing out within the, within the space going on here. All right, so let's see. There's a variety of different things we can do with this. If you're interested in any of the topics up here, including uh, sex-based uh, assortment of the landscape, some temporal effects, I'd be happy to talk, uh, talk to you about that a little bit. And then thanks to everyone. This um, research actually started... Uh, I'm surprised to say it was actually nine years ago when I was a postdoc here for a year uh, at, at UT and this kind of some ideas germinated and, and came to fruition. Uh, but with that, we'll go ahead and take a small uh, five-minute break and reset to get ready to do a programming experiment.